An Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales Book 3, Chapter 6 That Humility Makes Us Love Our Own Abasement A step further, Philothea, would I lead you, and bid you in everything to welcome your own abasement. And if you ask what I mean, I answer that the word in Latin means humility, and humility abasement. So that when the Blessed Virgin says in her song of thanksgiving that because the Lord has regarded her humility, therefore all generations shall call her blessed, she means that God has looked favorably upon her abasement, her poverty and lowliness, in order to crown her with favors and graces. Yet there is a difference between the virtue of humility and abasement, for the latter is that littleness, meanness, and imperfection which is in us, although we think not of it. But humility consists in really knowing and freely acknowledging our abasement. Now, the perfection of this humility is not only to know and acknowledge it, but to take pleasure and delight therein, and that not from lack of spirit or energy, but the more to exalt God's majesty and to esteem our neighbors better than ourselves. The better to explain this duty to which I exhort you, I would have you remark that of the ills under which we labor, some are abject and others honorable. Now, many are ready to endure these last, the honorable ones, but few willingly submit to the former. For instance, take a devout hermit whose garments are tattered and himself cold and needy. Everyone honors him while they pity his sufferings. But if a poor mechanic, a needy gentleman, endures the same thing, he is despised and ridiculed, and so his poverty becomes abject. If one bound by vows of obedience receives meekly a sharp rebuke from his superior, or a child from his parent, it is called mortification, obedience, goodness. But if a man or woman of the world bears the same mortification meekly, it is called cowardice and want of spirit, even if born for the love of God. This again, then, is an abject endurance. One person has a sore on his arm, another on his face. The one suffers only from the disease. The other, in addition, has to endure disgust and aversion and abasement. What I say, then, is that we must not only learn to love our burden, which is done by the virtue of patience, but also to love its attendant abasement which is done by the virtue of humility. Again, some virtues involve abasement and some involve honor. For the world despises patience, gentleness, simplicity, and oftentimes humility itself. While it highly prizes sagacity, valor, and generosity, so too different fruits of the same virtue are differently esteemed. Thus, almsgiving and forgiveness of offenses are alike the result of charity. But while everyone honors the former, the world despises the latter action. A young person who resists the example of his or her companions and will not join in the excesses of pleasure, drinking, gambling, dressing, or idle talk, is ridiculed and criticized by the others. 
and his self-denial is called bigotry or affectation. Now to take such contempt gladly is to rejoice in abasement. Again, we are deputed to visit the sick. If it be to a poor and miserable man that I am sent, it is an abasement in the eyes of the world, and therefore I will welcome it. But if I, on the contrary, am sent to the rich, the abasement is spiritual, for it is neither as worthy or as meritorious an act, and therefore I will still delight in it. You fall in the street, and in addition to the hurt you receive, you become an object of ridicule. Well, receive it gladly. There are some failings in which there is no harm beyond their abasement, and though humility does not require us to commit them, it does require that having committed them, we should not vex ourselves on account of them. Such are foolish little sayings and doings, breaches of etiquette, and inadvertent actions which we are bound in prudence and courtesy to avoid, but, if guilty of them, then we should patiently accept the consequent abasement, and receive it willingly as a practical lesson in humility. I would go further still, and say that if I have been led through anger or wantonness to use unbecoming language, therein offending God and my neighbor, I should assuredly repent heartily, feel a lively regret for the offense, and do my utmost to make amends. But at the same time I would endeavor to welcome the abasement and degradation which are the result of my fault. And if it were possible to separate the two, I would undo the latter while humbly retaining the former. But although we welcome the abasement which accrues to us from our ills, we must not omit to remedy the ill, as far as may be, by all fair and legitimate means especially when it is of consequence. If I have got disease in my face, I should seek its cure, but not to forget the humiliation I have endured. If I have done something which offends no one, I will make no excuse, for though I was wrong, the evil is temporary, and I will not set aside the degradation which is entailed. But if out of carelessness or foolishness I have given cause of offense or scandal to any one, I will repair my fault with a sincere excuse. For that mischief is lasting, and charity obliges me to do it away. So occasionally charity requires us to remedy this abasement for our neighbor's sake who might be injured by our loss of reputation. But in such a case, while we conceal our degradation from the eyes of others, we must treasure it up in our own heart and not lose the lesson it teaches. If you ask me what are the most profitable humiliations, I reply that undoubtedly those that will do us most good and serve us best, which are accidental or attendant upon our position in life. Because these we do not seek for ourselves, but receive them as God sends them, and His choice is always better than ours. But if we must choose, no doubt the greatest are the best, and those are greatest which are most opposed to our natural inclinations always supposing them suitable to our condition in life. For I say once for all, that our own will and choosing hinder and lessen almost all our virtues. Ah, who can teach us to say with the royal psalmist, 
I had rather be despised in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of sinners. None can teach us that holy lesson, except he who to exalt us lived and died the scorn of men and the outcast of the people. I have said to you many things which will seem hard as you read them, but if you practice them, they will be as sweet to you as sugar and honey. End of chapter 6